morning and welcome. I am on the uh, Terry College Alumni Board and also I'm the co-chair for the Terry Third Thursday programs and we're really glad you're here this morning. It's great to see, see a full room. Um, if you haven't been here before, this is the Terry uh, College Executive Education Center and this is the home of the Terry College Atlanta programs. Um, I am, want to recognize our sponsors this morning, as always, and Bank of North Georgia is our Terry Third Thursday sponsor. Thank you all very much. <laughs> and we are also supported by two media sponsors, Public Broadcasting Atlanta, I don't know if we have anyone here this morning, and the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Yeah, in the back there. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. So before we go into the program, let me tell you what's coming up over the summer uh, for Terry Third Thursday. Uh, in July, July 15th, Mark Rosenberg, who is the president and CEO of the Task Force for Global Health, will be here. So a very relevant topic in July. And then in August, on August 19th, we have Ken Stewart. And Ken is the commissioner of the Georgia Department of Economic Development. So make sure to put those on your calendar for the summer. Uh, and I don't know if you're like me, but it is never too early to get ready for Georgia football. Am I right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, good dogs. Um, so the Terry Young Alumni Board has an event coming up next Thursday, the 23rd. And they're hosting a preseason tailgate to talk about the upcoming season with sports writer Tony Barnhart and Terry alum David Green. I've heard both of these guys speak <clears throat> at the Touchdown Club, and they're excellent. So I, I highly recommend you... Uh, attend that event. It's going to be at the Capital City Club in Brookhaven next Thursday. And if you have any questions about cost or registration, there's alumni uh, staff here who can help you out with that. One other thing that we've been working on and we're very proud to uh, announce is that Terry Third Thursday is now in another city. Actually this morning in Charlotte, uh, Ben Ayers, who is the director of the Tulsa School of Accounting, is actually speaking this morning at Terry Third Thursday in Charlotte. And we thought that this was a great way to reach out to where we have a really good base of alumni and uh, start another uh, Terry Third Thursday activity. So we're very excited about this opportunity. And now let's get to today's program and to James Shepard. Um, I'm very honored to be able to introduce a fellow uh, board member, James Shepard, and he's been here at Terry Third Thursday a lot. He's a, a big supporter, so you've probably seen him, and I think actually you've even done some introductions, James, so uh, you, you're not new to the podium. Um, and this morning, he is going to talk about the world-renowned Shepard Center, and James is the chairman and co-founder of the Shepard Center, which is the nation's largest catastrophic care hospital. And the mission of the Shepherd Center started with the treatment of people with spinal cord injuries. And the mission has grown and evolved over the years to now include acquired brain injuries, neurological disorders, and much more. And the positive change that the hospital brings about both individually and collectively is just amazing. Uh, and it's the direct result of hard years of work uh, and dedication from James' family, who's here with him today, from James, and really from a number of community and supporters in the community. Um, I got a list of all of James' organizations and awards, and if I read them all, he wouldn't have time to speak. So I'm just going to hit a couple of highlights on things that he felt like were the most important to him, or the things that meant a lot to him. And of course, one of those was being uh, the 2002 Distinguished Alumni Award winner by the Terry College, naturally. But uh, the JCs named him one of their 10 outstanding young men in America in 1985, and he was also chosen as one of the outstanding young persons of the world by the international JCs that same year. He's the recipient of the Chi Phi Walter Cronkite Award, and the Shepherd Center was called to be a founding sponsor of the 1996 Paralympic Games in Atlanta, and James served on that committee. Uh, he served as a leader of the Disability Awareness Committee at First Presbyterian Church since 1990, along with a number of other accessibility committees. Uh, James has a very inspiring story. We're looking forward to hear it this morning, and we welcome you. James Shepard.
Well, first, thank you all for, for being here this morning um, to listen. I've heard a lot of good speakers here and hope we can do this. I'm going to apologize in advance if I don't exactly follow the uh, PowerPoint. Uh, the story I've told so many times, but sometimes I get more passionate about little pieces than I do with other things, and I'm certainly not going to read the slides. But this has been a family journey, and mother and dad have been very much a part of it. They were on one side of the bed. I was on the other side of the bed. So sometimes the tellings of the stories come from those unique viewpoints. And I grew up kind of loving adrenaline, whether it was drag racing, skydiving, you know, motorcycles, if it, if it went fast or fell far, I, I was in. And, and you could kind of, yeah. And it, this is one of the things that's, that's kept mother and dad so young is trying to keep up with the things I like to do. So it's been, been a real journey. But I went to University of Georgia, graduated in 73, and a friend and I decided we were going to go travel the world. And the idea being, you know, let, let's go now where schedule's not an issue, and we'll start, we'll do Africa and then South America. I'd been to Europe several times, so we wanted to go somewhere that was kind of off the beaten path at the time. So you know, I packed up and uh, started in 1973 in May, and haircut was a little different and that kind of thing. But <laughs> we, we basically backpacked and hitchhiked down the east coast of Africa. And, discovered that body surfing over there on waves that were very much different than the East Coast was quite different. We were looking at 20 and 25 foot waves and you know you could no, no board because boards are for sissies. But you could come down you could come down a wave and ball up at the bottom, count to about five and you'd be back at the top coming down again. So it was a lot of fun and you know massive waves and, and they really drove adrenaline. Yeah, we got to Rio de Janeiro after spending seven and a half months in Africa. And we'd been there the third day and sitting on the beach and the waves were about 14 feet. And I decided I, was, I needed cooling off and wanted to go out in the water. My two friends said, now nah, go ahead, we'll catch up with you. So about the third wave I caught, came off, went straight to the bottom. And I remember being stunned and hitting the bottom and, and tumbling underneath. And I thought, you know, I'm in the undertow, I need to get, to get out of it. And I'll wait till I feel the pressure of the next wave. And I waited, I felt the pressure, and I tried to kick off the bottom. And I couldn't kick off the bottom. And the next wave went over, and I was going to try and push with my arms. And I could not push. So at that point, I realized something was terribly wrong. And the fear set in, I'm going to drown. And that fear lasts as long as you can hold your breath. At a certain point, the body takes over. You choke on some water. Your lungs fill. And I can still remember very vividly feeling the sand and the water going up and down my throat, but going to sleep very peacefully. Woke up on the beach in a little, under a little tin roof. The lifeguard had pulled me out of the surf. I was blue, so he walked away. And my two friends saw the crowd and came down and resuscitated me. And they started calling. They made the phone call that every parent dreads to my parents and said, you know, there's been a terrible accident. And that's when your heart stops if you're on that end of the phone. And they started trying to get the U.S. Embassy and engage the doctors and the people. And they took me to a really fancy, huge hospital in Rio. It was about a 20-bed hospital. It's been torn down the last five years. And kind of crude and mother and dad started calling all their friends gathering cash because there were no ATMs, there were no credit cards and they knew they'd need money when they got there. So they probably, I don't know how many neighbors they beat up for funds to try and come and bridge that gap till they could figure out how to transfer money. But it's interesting, and they arrived in Rio and uh, found me in pretty tough shape. And that picture's not day one, but the, the little beds were built for people much shorter than I am. My feet stuck through the bed rails I was in traction in, from breaking the neck, and about the second day or third day, I forget which, mother and dad came into the room with a doctor and they said, you know, we've got a real bad problem. Not only are, are you paralyzed from the neck down, but you've got pneumonia, and if we don't put you on a ventilator, you're going to drown in your own fluids and die. So they came in, gave me a couple of shots of Novocaine, cut my throat, and popped me on, and I, I was dependent on the machine to breathe. 
And we spent five glorious weeks of problem after problem after problem going downhill. There were no air ambulances. We couldn't charter a plane from Delta or Varig. They had decided that uh, if I died on the way back, we might sue them. So we finally, through Herm Senator Herman Talmadge, arranged for the Air Force to send a C-141 medevac down there. And Dad had the privilege of paying for the fuel and the flight crew at that time. Five weeks after injury, we were loaded up, headed back, and Dad tells the story of the captain or the pilot coming back and asking the flight surgeon any special instructions. And she said, yes, sea level cabin pressure, which meant they couldn't get very high. And he said, for how long? And she said, all the way to Atlanta. So we had to stop in Roosevelt Roads to buy fuel. That thing was sucking. I don't know how many gallons an hour it burns, but it was a, a very expensive trip back. And we thought, you know, if we ever get back to Atlanta, Georgia, to our doctors, everything will be fine. And we arrived and uh, went straight into ICU, and they did a good job keeping me alive. I mean, I think they were experimenting every day with what was going wrong. They had really no experience. Most people that broke their neck like I did back then died. And there were some discussions, you know, life's never going to be any good. You'll be on the ventilator the rest of your life. Why don't we think about unplugging you? And uh, I watched my parents nearly kill a couple of doctors. I mean, I, I heard the conversations, I listened, and I don't know how, I think they were really serious too, because uh, some of the doctors didn't look too comfortable coming back into the rooms. But I got out of ICU and they put me in this wonderful bed called a circle electric bed. And this thing was built so you didn't get pressure sores and it would turn head over heels. They'd bring that top frame down, sandwich in, turn the bed, take the frame off and start over. And you can see in the, top picture up there that I'd beefed up to a whopping 82 pounds. So things were pretty grim. I mean, it was one of those where you, you wondered some days, were you going to live? Were you going to survive? And if you did, what was life going to be like? So we played for a long time. A man used to come by every Sunday and visit me named Clark Harrison. He was a friend of the family's, wounded by a sniper in World War II. And so he was in a wheelchair, paraplegic. And the first day he came in, he came in and he said, you know, son, you're not the only poor paralyzed SOB in the world. We need to get over that. And he was pretty direct, but he ran his own business. He developed real estate. He was a DeKalb County commissioner, had run, and you know, said, you know, no one can beat a man in a wheelchair. And Clark knew no obstacles. So he was one of those that was refreshing that was the only person sort of like me that I encountered while I was at Piedmont. But anyway, he told Dad that you know he had, had, he had been to Denver, Colorado to this rehab facility. And he went because here he developed a horrible pressure sore on his tail. And they messed with it and sort of healed it and messed with it. And finally the guy says, his physician said, look, just stuff it with gauze and one day we'll amputate your legs. And that was the state of treatment in Atlanta, Georgia in the 70s. But Clark went out there and they took him, they did a skin flap, plastic surgery, repaired it put him in a wheelchair that actually fit. It had a cushion that would prevent, they showed him how to shift his weight. And as he said, they gave him his life back. So Clark was one of those that meant a lot to me. Dad flew out, came back, told me what he saw. He said, what do you want to do? I said, let's get the heck out of here. We're not going anywhere right here. So the 5th of February, I left for Denver, Colorado and arrived and there were people like me there were people with broken necks, some on ventilators, some not. And I'd gotten off the vent at that time and was moving a little bit of my left arm. I started moving two fingers and two toes. And we stayed out there until the 14th of June, but was able to walk out 14th of June with one crutch and a long leg brace. And that was a pretty exciting day. But it was also a time when I realized you know, what, what, what am I going to really do? My life had been a road map. I was going to go to UGA, travel, go into the family business, building roads and bridges and developing real estate. So I had this road charted out like I think all of us do and then took that hard left turn in life. Well, the good news is I did go to work in the family business. But I, when I got back, I called Clark Harrison and took him to lunch to say thank you and tell him what it meant to me to have him come by and visit. 
And we were sitting at lunch, and I said, you know, Clark, someone ought to do that here in Atlanta. We had to go to Denver, Colorado. We claimed to be an international city, and no one here had a clue what to do with me. And I went home and talked to mom and dad about my visit, and they kind of nodded and agreed, and the idea went around and around, and 14 months later, we opened our doors with six beds in a general hospital. They had given us a commitment for 22 beds. And we thought, you know, in five or six years, maybe we'll have them full. Well, they were full in about a year. So it was, it was really kind of like a rocket ship. I had hired a physical therapist and an occupational therapist that were supervisors in Denver, Colorado. And then Dr. Apple came on board. He was the one that gave us medical credibility. He was one of the young, hot-handed individual surgeons in Atlanta and committed to give up enough time to come with us and give us the medical credibility we needed. And thinking back, if we hadn't had him, it wouldn't have gone everywhere, anywhere. We got laughed out of every hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. You know, there is no need, it'll never work, you don't know what you're doing. So we, we kept flying along at that point, and by 1977, the waiting list had started to really grow, and 25 and 30 people at a time were on it. So it was, it was something we were sitting there, and we, you know, we realized that the hospital wasn't going to give us any more rooms. And it's probably a blessing that they didn't. But we decided we needed to be our own facility, located next, excuse me, next to a general hospital. And the dream was to be like the place in Denver someday. So we started raising money beating up every friend that the family had in business that sold pipes, sold tractors, or sold anything, anyone we went to church with, anyone we'd been to school with. And we found some property next to Piedmont Hospital where we sit today. And Scott Hudgens owned that property. And he sold it to us a lot less. He wanted a million six for it. That's what he told Piedmont. He sold it to us for a million, gave us $100,000, $200,000 back at closing, and said, y'all are doing this for the right reasons. So it was really interesting to, to watch that. I'm going to beg your indulgence. My legs are not going to cooperate this morning, so I'm going to finish sitting, and uh, we'll, do, we'll do it from that side. Can I get you to grab the chair? Someone just pull that out of the way. There we go. So May, May of 82, we moved in to the... Uh, existing building. Mother and dad were absolutely in, on board. Mother's probably one of the best fundraisers in the country. But in, in 82, we had the property bought. We had a contract with a contractor for $7.4 million. We had about $3.2 million pledged at, or in hand. And the Woodruff Foundation was one of those that had given us some seed money. And I went down to see Beaufort Jones, and I said, you know, Beaufort what do we do? I'm scared to death. You know, we're not even a, a third of the way there. And both places said, you know, go ahead, build. And the money will start coming when they see the bricks from Peachtree. And I don't know if I really believed that or if I thought he was going to rescue us if we didn't get where we needed to be. But we, we started. <laughs> yeah, we, we took our census down to six patients, moved in that May. And I still remember staff going and trying to find where the linen closet was. And we had so little money, we were buying housekeeping, food service, pharmacy, x-ray, dietary, everything from Piedmont that they'd sell us. And they were pretty good about, you know, cooperating on the, on the float on the money and things. And those, we thought, you know, we've, we've got a third floor shelled in, and one day we'll be 80 beds, and that's probably a decade away. We were in the second 40 beds 18 months later. So it's been, been kind of like uh, flying a jet while it's up and running. And, and it's been a very exciting journey. And I'm not going to read all these. You can read these as I talk. But we've, we've got a mission and in a condensed format, and I, I kind of co-opted SunTrust, is seeing beyond injury. Because anyone can treat the orthopedic injury. Anyone can treat the, the trauma to the brain. It's how do you take that person and re-engage them in life? How do you return them to productivity? What do you do with that? And there are a lot of different things you look at and, and the growth that's gone along. Some of the great things that have happened is we started that May 
moved into the, the next 40. Then in 1992, we expanded the facility and put the Billy Marcus building up. Bernie had become a, a big fan and a huge supporter. And at that time, we had gone into it and said, we'll have a pediatric rehab and do spinal cord pediatrics. And we partnered with Choa and Eggleston at the time. And between the three of us, we could never get over about seven patients. So we had all this staff trained, a great building, great facility, and looked at it. And we said, you know, if we look back, we've always had about 15 to 20 percent of our patients who broke their neck who also had a head injury. Because if you shake your neck, a lot of times that injury is the same or you hit your head. So we decided we'd go into the brain injury business. And that's been wildly successful. We piggybacked on the reputation of the hospital and it's taken off and growing. It's going to end up being a 30 bed unit soon. We're getting ready to finish construction on it. Some of the great things in recognition, I mean, we're a model center. We've been in U.S. News and World Report since 2000 as a top 10 hospital. Probably the one that I'm most proud of is the NDN CQI, and that's based on actual quality data from nursing. And that, that's been a, a great recognition because it's not one of these. I mean, so, to some degree, U.S. News is reputation, but to some degrees, it's kind of like the rankings of the colleges. There are a lot of metrics that drive those, a lot of things that go on. This is a map of where our patients come from. We've had patients from all 50 states, and then you can see the little dots down there to the foreign countries people have come from. So we're doing something right. And, and what is it that draws all these people to come in here? What drives people to come? And, and, it's, and it's the continuum of care. We, we can start and admit you to ICU, then move you on into the acute rehab phase. And then if you're a spinal cord injury, we move you into day program after that, where you live in family housing next door with your loved one or independently. And find out, can you really do all the bathing transfers and different things that are required? Can you really do what you say you can do? And it gives them that opportunity to move on and, and refine the skills and get stronger. It was also a response to managed care. They kept pressuring us to have shorter and shorter stays. And we found that when we get them to the point where they no longer need nursing care, we can take them, put them out, drop the nursing charge out, and extend the stay and deliver the skills that we need to deliver to that patient and still please the insurance companies. And they're, they're not an easy crowd, and they change every year what they want to do. But it's, it's, it's that continuum in the family involvement. These are some of our outcomes. We're the dark blue bars, and the light blue is the nation. Two of them, I think, that really make a difference are the national average return to home instead of a nursing home is about in the low 70 percent. We run about 97, 98 percent return to home. The other statistic that really am, I think we're proud of is that return to productivity. That means back to being a student, back to your job, or back to being a homemaker. And the national average return to productivity is about 17 percent. We run about 38 percent. So we stack our outcomes up against anybody in the country. I mean, it's, it's one of those where you, you look at what drives things and what makes you different, and it's outcomes. And the picture on the, my right up there is the uh, Woodruff family housing. Jane Woodruff took a, a real interest. We were swamped. We were renting, I think at one time, about 31 apartments to house the families. And it was costing us an absolute fortune. The, the family housing, assistive technology, all that we call these community benefit programs, require about $10 million a year coming through the door to maintain. They're not reimbursed. If you're an hour's drive away or more, you've got 30 days of free housing. Then there's a gap if you don't move straight into day program or we've found churches that'll help out in that. And then they move back into the housing. So you, you've got over 80 units there. We've got 12 more apartments down behind Benihana and we've got another 26 condos that right now we're using for the soldiers that we're treating coming into the SHARE program that Mr. Marcus has founded. So a lot of the things we do, we couldn't do without the community support. But this is what drives outcomes. This is what makes the difference. To go to the brain injured individuals over on Claremont, we've got a post-acute program called Shepherd Pathways. And no one else in the country does this, but we take people and they either stay in the housing there or housing closer to that. And we continue to refine their speech, their cognitive abilities, and the different things you've got. With a head injury, it's really interesting. 
one of the first things you do is make them mobile. The, the physical pieces usually come back before the cognitive and the mental. So you've got someone upright that's mobile that's now dangerous because they don't have judgment. So the, 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 the post-acute place is, is really, really needed, and it's really, really needed around the country. And it's changed the outcomes. It's changed how people go back, what they do, and how successful they are. One of the things that you're going to get a chance to vote on in this state is the trauma network. $10 on your tag fee. And there's a magic hour if you get to a trauma center that if you get there within that hour, and I would argue it's closer to 30 minutes, the injury that you may have to your brain or your spine is lessened by the early intervention, the things to relieve pressure and damage. And, and we're going to receive a patient with a much better potential for rehabilitation and better outcomes. You go to southwest Georgia, and you're going to be lucky if you get somewhere sometimes in two hours. So I would encourage all of you to read up on that one and see if you're willing to pay 10 bucks for yourself or for someone else, because it's, it's a very important piece that's getting ready to roll. This is a list of our donor-funded programs. Um, some of the real highlights are our therapeutic recreation. We've got about 14 sports teams, wheelchair tennis, wheelchair basketball, um, fencing, swimming, kayaking. We've got a bass fishing team. And I would argue that therapeutic recreation, even though it's never defined as medically necessary, is one of the most important programs we do. Because you take a patient and put them back in the community, active and engaged, and we see them readmitted fewer times with complications. So it's just like you stay in fit jogging or playing tennis or playing golf, whatever you do. But assistive technology is another one that's in there. We take people and they can re-engage even if they've got nothing but head movement with a sip and puff control or a voice control. If they don't even have head movement, we've had some patients like that that are injured like Chris Reed at C1, C2. You can use an eye gaze system and you reflect a little beam off the retina of the eye and use it to pause on the mouse and, and on the menu. We had a girl go back to Rhodes and actually graduate from college with that system. So it's amazing when you, when you look at these people, you think, oh, how terrible. But you don't realize the depth and spirit of the humans that we have as patients and all of you all. I mean, when you're asked to dig deep, you, you'd be just surprised at the people that go out and live very full lives with a sip and puff control to drive their wheelchair or voice control to do things. So a lot of those programs are really key to the outcomes we've got. We've got a pool where we teach swimming. It's got a deep end for scuba diving, all kind of different things that are out there. And it, it, it's a great program. We can use it for therapy. If you can take someone who's getting leg movement back, put them chest deep out in the water at the right depth, and move trace muscles and really get engaged from there. Research is really starting to drive what happens in outcomes. We've got what we call activity-based therapy, and it runs from some little electrical bicycles to what we call FES, functional electrical stem bikes, that we put electrodes on and they can engage your muscles if they're not working. They maintain muscle bulk, they help with bone density, they help with circulation, there are a whole ton of benefits. Those along with manual treadmills and then a robotic walker we call the locomat. We can take people and with a harness we can suspend them and change from 5% body weight all the way up to 90 and vary the speed of the thing. And those are bringing incomplete injuries like I was back up to speed far, far quicker than the older therapies that were around. I kind of get jealous sometimes when I watch what's going up there. And the, 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 the walking is in the neural recovery network that uh, we co-brand with the Christopher Reeve Foundation. There are seven centers around the country that are engaged with that. And it's a research project. But we're also utilizing the research in daily therapy because I can tell you that even without the data, anecdotally, these things work, and there's no question about it. The Beyond Therapy is a post-acute program where we take patients and really engage them in core strength and other things. We've got some people that have been in that two and three and four years. That's a picture of the locomat up there and a young man on it, and it's got a graph with feedback and that. And some of the things these do that hold potential are in the, the research and things that are coming, some of the things that we call restorative therapies. And no one yet knows whether that's going to be 
through bone marrow stem cells, adult stem cells, embryonic cells, or cord blood. I mean, no one knows. You'll hear all the politicians claim, well, we know that bone marrow works. Well, I'll challenge you to find a study in spinal cord injury or brain injury at clinicaltrials.gov. Everything that goes to the FDA is listed there, and there's not one there. And our politicians are being told by some of the interest groups that are particularly opposed to embryonic stem cell research that all these things have been tried and embryonic doesn't work, and these do. So we've been fighting this battle down at the Georgia legislature for about five years now, and some days we pull our, pull our hair out with some of the things they're told. We keep trying to give them facts and treat, keep trying to educate them. The first approved embryonic stem cell study was approved January a year and a half ago by Geron. They partnered with Hans Kerstead out at the Reeve Irvine Center in California and had it approved. We were going to open recruiting in June of last year. We were the only one of seven centers around the country that had been selected that was up, trained, and ready. We got two patients to consent and say yes, they would agree to undergo this. And unfortunately, the hardware in their neck made getting a picture of the size of the lesion nearly impossible. So we had to disqualify him. The third was Hispanic, and we did not feel morally that we could bring him up to cons informed consent at the appropriate level. So we disqualified him. They called the study off because there were some microscopic cysts that were found. Um, they've been spending, since that got called off last July, recooking the rats, if you will. Uh, the data's back. The FDA's reviewed it. Um, they won't come in officially, but I bet you it rolls out in August or September of this year. There's also a trial going on at Emory University for ALS with embryonic stem cells. And the phase one has cleared the hurdle, so they'll move to phase two. They're very, very interested in spinal cord injury. I think they found a partner somewhere real close to Emory that's going to be the place where the patients would be recruited. That one could happen sometime in the next year. So it's, it's an exciting time to watch and see what's out there. What, what are the possibilities? I mean, if we're serious about controlling health care costs in this country, regenerative research, and I don't, it doesn't matter to me whether it's cord blood, adult bone marrow, or embryonic stem cells, but those all have potential for spinal cord, MS, ALS, sickle cell anemia, adult and juvenile diabetes, all these chronic diseases and injuries that consume so big, such big dollars in healthcare every year for your lifetime. So it's a, it's a great and exciting time in medicine. Um, what is national healthcare gonna do? We don't have a clue. Our goal is to have a strategic plan that goes out one year to 18 months and be nimble and be able to react and see which ways we need to go with it. But it, we, we, we now see in spinal cord injury, brain injury, multiple sclerosis, I think we've got about 3,400 MS patients under our care. And then we've got a pain center, and that's open to you all as general public. I mean, we treat back pain, shoulder pain, we do acupuncture, we look at alternative medicine. So from a little bitty dream of a 40-bed hospital and want to be 80 one day and just do spinal injuries, this thing is kind of morphed, and it's a great thing we didn't cast it in concrete because we've had the freedom to add things. And it's all stayed focused around the neurological and, and the core of the neurological system and those injuries or diseases. But it's given us the freedom to also take on other underserved, poorly served, and unmet needs in this community. And every time we've gone into one of these other diseases or injuries, it's been based on feedback from that group in the community. You know, the MS people came in and said, you know, we're, you're, you're letting us come here for our peer support meetings, and we're all coming in and talking in the room. But what we see is you've got the, the doctor here, you've got the MRI here, you've got the acute therapy, and you've got the health and wellness all involved in one place, rather than to have in piecemeal that in 8, 10, 12, 14 different locations. So they, it's all grown out of community need and things that we're good at. Um, we've, we've been approached several times about going into geriatric stroke. We don't need to do that. Uh, Wesley Woods does a very fine job with that. We will take young strokes and certain ones where we don't have a, a massive diffuse bleed. So we, we, we look in an arena that's very specific and focused. And it's been a wonderful journey. I mean, I, I could go on for hours and hours, but I'm going to open up to the floor and see if anyone has any questions.
Yes, sir. I was just wondering what what does the uh, Shepherd Center want from the community around you, volunteer wise, community sport uh, support. What what kind of needs do you need from from us? Well, the, the things in the, in the community. I mean, fir first one is to be an advocate. You know, when you hear of someone that's injured, that's in any of the arenas that we touch and treat, go and say, hey, here's a place that's a resource. Encourage them to compare. I mean, I always tell families that come to visit, you don't want to ever look back and wonder, was this the right choice? I say, you know, go to Denver, go to RIC, go to Kessler, go to McGee, pick, pick two or three and, and, and go see what they do. And then tell me what, what you think, you know, and then make your choice. Most don't, if they'll come, they, they, they come on in the door and get admitted. So if you can become an advocate in the community, volunteers, we've got about 700 active volunteers. It's everything from stuffing envelopes to feeding patients to helping man the Peachtree Road Race. I mean, that's usually the young people. They're, they're meeting the athletes at the airport the day before, transporting the race chair, helping them get to the hotel. They're at the start line, the finish line. They're bringing them back to the hospital. We've got a summer sports camp in Alabama that runs about a week. We have people that come for the whole week, have people that come for two days hands-on with the patient. You're in the water helping a guy learn to balance and get up on a sit ski, how to learn to kayak, canoe, swim. I mean, it's, it's a great experience if you're looking for something really hands-on. We have some corporations that come in and do cookouts for the families that are there in the housing. They'll come in, one group every spring barbecues a huge pig. We had a group come in a couple of weeks ago that just came and cooked hamburgers and hot dogs. And that was their first entry with us. It's National Distributing. Jay Davis has been a friend and the Carlos have been friends, and they're, they're wanting to get involved hands-on. So, you know, advocate, volunteer, and then donate. I mean, the, the 10 million that, that's up there in those community programs, community-funded programs, is the minimum it requires for those to run every year. Now, we've been blessed. I mean, two, three years ago, we had 18 million come through the door, and that was because we had an active and ongoing capital campaign, and we had the other coming. This year looks like we're going to be in about the 12 to $13 million range. And, and the, the pieces that are over those programs are the ones that allow us to do unique things, to pursue unique opportunities, to seed new research projects and things like that. So any of the three, two of the three, all of the three. Hey, James, uh, certainly uh, you and your center have come a, a long way from your you know, small hospital in uh, Rio. Uh, it might be a tough question, but uh, can you pinpoint one or two things that you're you know, most proud of from, you know, again, back from your days in uh, Rio to till today? Yeah, I'd, I'd say probably one of the most proud things I think everyone at the hospital is, is proud of that was there was the 1996 Paralympic Games. Those were not going to happen in Atlanta in 96. ACOG, was, their focus was the Olympic Games, and they didn't want anything to distract from their mission and what they were doing, and thought that by helping take that on, that would do that. We were very successful in grabbing some corporate clients like Home Depot, because Bernie had been a big supporter, Don Keogh at Coke, and that, that became a great platform to move how young people and their families viewed people with disabilities. I mean, you look at Tony Volpentest, he was born a congenital amputee, no, no limb past those joints. Had the wonderful flex foot legs, had to have some blocks about that high to get up to run the 100. And in the 100 meter, he was all of three tenths of a second off Carl Lewis's world record. So I mean, you know, don't tell me some of these aren't elite athletes. And, and I can tell you that some of the Olympic athletes are not elite. I mean, go, go back and look at some of the bobsled teams that have been around. But, I mean, it was a time to, 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 really, move, to really move Atlanta and, and shape the mindset about what people in chairs are capable of and, and where they can go with their lives. So that's one of them. Then there's the, the multitude of disability access. And I don't mean that in just ramps, but been, we've been involved as an institution and me individually with MARTA, with the Georgia Dome, with other places. So the hospital's very much been a wonderful platform to move this city to being a great place for people on wheels or crutches and things like that, and to change their thinking about that. So those are two, the second one being very broad, those are, those are two of the, 
proudest things we do. I mean, you get pride every day when you, when you walk in and you look at a patient. And when they came through the door, they're on a stretcher and their families come in. Their family looks like they hadn't slept in two weeks. And they look like they're standing in front of the train about to be hit. And they think life's over. And you watch them the day they're leaving. And whether they're walking or they've just gotten good skill sets, and you watch them back up. And they're running around hugging staff. We've had six that I remember, there may be more, that came back and had their weddings at the hospital. I mean, you know, can you imagine going back where you went through that kind of experience to get married? So it must be a pretty decent experience. Some of those moments really make you tear up and realize what the staff and what the institution has done, how they've touched people. Um, James, I have one question. Um, when you first opened your, um, your small center back many, many years ago, only have four, six bed, did you ever think thinking about your business will go up so big like today? And also I want to know what's the major reason or what's the, the biggest incentive for you to decide you want to raise more money and to expand business? Um, first answer is no, we probably never in our wildest dreams thought we'd be where we are today. I mean, I don't think mother or dad did, I did. Our dream was to, you know, one day be about 80 beds and, and, and do one thing and do it really well. So, no clue. The, the incentive is to watch what we do for people, to, to, to raise more money, to give them the best treatments out there, the, the cutting edge, as close to the bleeding edge as we can, and to change the mindsets of the old conventional therapies. Technology is bringing some of that restorative medicine. Hopefully, we'll bring some more. But, but when you watch what these new programs, what Therapeutic Rec does, what assistive technology, what driver's training, I mean, we've got a van that's about a quarter of a million dollars. And if you come in in a wheelchair, we can swing about six different types of controls in front of you to put you back in the wheel. And one of them just got a little steering wheel like this that takes no pressure. It's all hydraulic. So a guy with really limited arm movement can actually drive this van. Now, you might want to be careful on Peachtree, because that's where we train. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I just further want to ask you, you know, have you ever been scared? Maybe your business will be failed, and you're in deep shit of a lot of debt. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think we've ever been scared of it. I mean, every time we've gotten up to something like having a contract for $7.4 million and three point two in hand, God's looked after us. I mean, the, 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 something just seems to drop in, the right person, the right donor or the right talent to take that program to that level. So I think if you do, in any business, do things for the right reasons, do them with integrity, do them with a set of values and vision and mission, you're gonna succeed. It's tough to follow that last question. Um, <laughs> you mentioned working with Emory on that, the stem cell stuff. Have you done any work with the University of Georgia? Have you, has the University of Georgia reached out to you at all on any of the science We, we do a lot of work. Um, we, we interact a lot with Dr. Steve Stice, who's the one that cloned the cattle, works in the embryonic arena. Um, we've got, I forget, I counted up, and I think it was 16 touch points. And that would go from internships with the School of Social Work, um, the School of Pharmacy. I don't think we've got a pharmacist that didn't come out of UGA. Um, some of the neuroscience pieces up there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dudley was a professor that was engaged with research up with us and was coming down actually for a research meeting to our place. In his truck, someone crossed the center line, he became a head injury. And we were able to successfully get him re-engaged as a professor at UGA. So lots of different touch points. Um, that Georgia Tech's got some great biomechanical research. So we partner with everyone in, in little niches, little places. But UGA has been a rich environment for us. We're a great research target, if you will. And that's kind of putting it a little cold. But we've got a patient base with so many that we've seen that to do research or interact and do studies. So it's a great partnership. I mean, the student, the professor, and the school gets a lot out. We get a lot of great analysis and a lot of great results. Some of the stuff with tech, um, we've noticed two or three years ago, all the kids come in and had earbuds and iPods. And if you can't move your head, you can't turn it on or control it. So unofficially, Apple's been working with us. We've adapted it and took some of it apart. And you can run it with a sip and buff control now. So there are a lot of things that happen. Apple would work publicly if the blind weren't suing them because they don't have tactile feedback on their iPhone. <laughs> Uh, 
Yeah, so I had a question. First of all, I want to say that your story is incredible in the family and everything you all have done. Atlanta is very, very lucky, and I think you should be recognized for that. My question for you today is um, how do you like to spend your time? You're so inspiring, and I'm wondering if you are – do you spend a lot of your time talking to um, – patients that have been injured recently? Do you travel to inspire new therapies? I can just imagine you're pulled in so many directions. Probably the thing I enjoy most is not working, but spending time, whether it's the end of the day or in a patient room, talking to a patient about my experience, about where they can go, what, what they can do, not what they can't do. And Clark Harrison really framed it well. He said, you know, before you got injured, there were probably 10,000 things that you might have been able to attempt. And you were probably gonna get a shot at 5,000. Said now they're probably only 6,000 and you hope you get to try 3,000. You know, where do you fit them in? But I, I remember talking to one patient who was on a ventilator and he was really struggling to wean and get off. He left on the vent. And about a year later, I ran into him at a party and didn't even recognize him. No ventilator, had gained weight, looked healthy. I went and said, I'm, I'm, I'm totally drawn a blank. Tell me your name. He said, I'm David. And he said, the 45 minutes you spent with me that day gave me the courage to continue to try. So, you know, what would I prefer to do? Not work, interact with patients, with staff. And it, we brought the Grady ER docs in, and they had, you know, they're the trauma surgeons, and let them eat lunch, tour, and then introduced them to two patients they'd recently had as trauma patients. One of the neurosurgeons who was a resident had worked on this young man and said, you know, I know he's here, um, still in coma, is he ever gonna live? And we took him out and sat him on the mat and let him engage in conversation with this guy. And he says, you know, this has forever changed how I'm gonna practice trauma medicine. So yeah, whether it's the patient or professional staff, those are the things that we hope I have, family has, and staff have the opportunity to share and try and raise the bar, you know, even other places around the country. James, what are your, um, well, with health form, healthcare reform underway, what are your concerns but also visual possibilities about for the Shepherd Center? You know, we don't really know where it's going to go. There's some language in it right now that, contrary to what people are telling you, is close to rationing some of the things that they talk about paying for for people who are going to be viewed as productive, employable, well, you know, with a national average of 17% return to productivity, are they really going to pay for that $30,000 wheelchair? And there's something that costs that much with the sip and puff control. And you want to throw a notebook ventilator on the back, you're, you know, 35, 40. So are they going to buy this equipment? I mean, they, they pay so well right now anyway. We get 62 cents on the dollar of cost, not charges. And, and we find a way. That, you know, healthcare, quite honestly, shifts cost. All of you with private insurance. We're going to get it out of you to help subsidize the government. When it started out, the government paid better than private, and they figured out how to turn the tables. I think we ought to come down and say, here are what our costs are. Here's a reasonable return. And pay it across all this so none of, no one's fighting, and we don't have to sit there and play games. It's maddening. I don't know where it's going to go. It's, it's kind of frightening. In some ways, it's, it's good. In others, there's a, a concept called bundling that they're talking about. They're talking about paying for quality. We're excited. If they go that direction, we will excel in our reimbursement. It, it'll be great. And we, we think that is probably going to overcome some of the other negatives out there. But right now, Medicare and Medicaid buy you one great wheelchair. And if the cushion deteriorates, which it will over about a five-year period, or the back and upholstery get bad, and you're going to develop a pressure sore if it doesn't get replaced, they won't pay for that. They wait until you have a pressure sore, spend three or four months in the hospital, spend about $200,000, then you're chronic, then you can have the cushion. So, I, you know... I, I could really rant on health care and reimbursement, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going to be a challenge. What about yeah, one, one of the neat things recently, and it came out of Christopher Reeve working with Dr. Ray Anders up in Chicago, is an abdominal pacer. They used to try and pace the phrenic nerve to get you off a vent, and that would work for about two to three years and then the phrenic nerve would burn from the charge of trying to drive the, the muscles. And Ray developed a way to put electrodes into your abdominals and with a little external piece looks like an insulin pump, 
pace the abdominals and, and drive those muscles just like an FES bike. And his weaning rate is incredible for people that would otherwise never wean. I've um, got a good friend that I've known since probably high school. Came in as a C2 last November. They put the abdominal pacer in, Dr. Canciarini did at Piedmont, six days post-injury, which was unheard of. The clinical trial, we waited a year post-injury to see if they were gonna get better. And Canciarini and Donner said, you know, let's put it in right at the start. Let's don't let the muscles atrophy. And this guy's getting ready to go to California in August. He's still sipping puff. He has supports for his head. He can feel nothing on the back. I mean, he basically feels in that arena. That's his only sensory input. He's just got back from Charleston. He's discovered the Pilatus airplane out at Epps with a back clamshell door and a ramp so they can tie him down and fly. I mean, and this is a guy who was international president of World President's organization that flew all over the world. So his world has opened back up. And I got a note from his wife the other day that said, you know, you got us in touch with Delta. You've shown us we can fly. We never dreamed when we went through the facility that this kind of life would ever be possible again. So no matter how severe the disability, the doors are open. And, and, and it's great to watch those people re-engage those little opportunities. Mr. Shepard. Um, this is kind of, a, I guess, a polarizing question. So I'm a little nervous asking it. But um, from my limited knowledge in stem cell research and seeing the political landscape, it seems that there's a, a significant religious opposition to the procedures. And you seem to be a devout individual. So I was curious as to what your rebuttal would be um, to the Christian coalitions and other religious organizations that are in opposition? Well, my comfort level, because I do consider myself a born-again Christian, comes from my view of stem cells. You get what they call multipotent, which are the bottom, I call them the bottom rung, because they're the least able to change and morph into other things. And that would be adult bone marrow cells. And they may work for some things, I hope they do. Cord blood would be a multipotent. And when you have in vitro fertilization and you get a pluripotent cell, which is what an embryonic stem cell is, and embryonic is an unfortunate word when you look at it, because those cells, when combined in a Petri dish, have no potential for life until they attach to the wall of the uterus. Then they can become a human, or will become a human most times. So we take a couple and we let them have in vitro fertilization. And I remember when they started that, we were worried about three-headed kids and four-armed kids. And, you know, it, it, it's still embryonic research. But we allow that couple to have a child, two children, three children. And then the great blessing that you look at is you can take those leftover cells and let them become the organ donation for someone, whether it's heart tissue, spinal cord tissue, without putting a knife to any of those other children. I, I think they've taken an extreme view. And that's just mine. I mean, there are probably people in this room that don't agree with me, but I've been down at the legislature and one of the state senators said, James, they have misled you. They've lied to you. And I said, I'm sorry, Senator. I've, I've had 35 years in this. I watched the cure is here be talked about two years after I was hurt. And I've had plenty of time to form my own opinion, talk to many scientists. And that's where I get comfortable with it, is, is that view. And that here's an opportunity for life. Let's, let's talk about right to life and right to quality of life. Sure, let's engage. And I have yet to find one of them that will step up and get on the podium with me. Mr. Shepard, you um, have discussed uh, a few personal stories you've shown us and, and talked quite a bit about some of the successes the Shepard Center has had in relation to, like, the national averages. Um, and I think some of it relates to kind of the variety of options and care that you have under one roof. What do you think... Uh, what is it about your team's approach um, to their work that you think is kind of the key contributor to the successes you're having? You know, the staff down there, we, we do a lot of scripting and a lot of training, and we can get behaviors. I mean, if you, once you work there long, you pick up the, the values that the family has and the passion of the family. It just becomes automatic. But we work hard on how you're going to greet someone in the hall. You're going to make eye contact. You're going to say hello. I mean, all the way down to our security, our housekeeping. The housekeeping, you all come in to clean the room, and he knows what kind of day you did in therapy. So there's this great team approach. There's this great passion. And I've watched our staff bat as hard as the family to get someone better. So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of things when we use our professional development fund to take uh, really 
research-oriented therapist or nurse and let her pursue a clinical research project in-house and then go present to their peers nationally. So we've let them get recognized at a higher level nationally. Now you put your people at risk of being hired away, but if you do that, your staff will excel and they'll bring the others up with them. We bring com competitors in all the time and show them what we do. And you know, there's no magic. It's, it's just a, a system that really works. And somebody said, well, do you worry they're gonna, I said, I hope they get better. But I said, uh, you know, I don't think they can get the culture. You know, I, I, I hope it raises the bar around the country because someone really doesn't need to come from Washington State in here. And the population growth is gonna take care of our capacity. I mean, we're running at about 116 out of 120 today. And last week there were 28 people teed up waiting and we were trying to make selection, selections based on best rehab potential. So there were some people that were told they needed to go somewhere else if the insurance company wasn't gonna let them stay where they were for 10 days, two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. for sharing your story You're this welcome. morning and thanks to you and your family for all you've done. It's, it's greatly appreciated. And um, I think you know we present a glass sculpture from uh, Loretta Evie uh, to thank you for your participation. Right. So again, thank appreciate you. you being here today. And remember when you uh, exit the garage, the magic words are Terry Third Thursday. All right, thanks. <laughs>